Hey there, welcome into Sports by the Book. Along with Alex White, I'm Matt Neverett. Jam-packed show here on a Tuesday as we gear you up for the NCAA tournament. Happy spring. First day of spring. Had to don a, a very festive floral shirt for the occasion. And uh, as we bring in Alex White, plenty not going on on today's show. We'll be joined in about 10 minutes by Jim Root of Three Man Weave. Talk about some of his favorite plays. And then at 340, we've got a treat. Matt Verjanic, former NCAA head coach. And uh, he's been around the game of basketball for his entire life. He's been a head coach at the collegiate level for over 40 years. He'll join us to talk about what it's like to coach in the NCAA tournament. He's a Pittsburgh guy, so he's got opinions on Duquesne seating and Pitt's exclusion from the big dance. Uh, we are filling out brackets still. We've got a couple of days to get uh, all of yours done. You've got a couple that you have complete. You're deciding which one is going to be your official bracket. I have my one that I did yesterday that was kind of just initial thoughts, get it on paper, make some adjustments there. Reason I bring that up is you can compete against Alex and I yep. in an ESPN bracket challenge. The link is in the bio of the video. It's also in the live comments of today's video. So be sure to not only leave your live comments, tell us some of your favorite plays, some of your favorite teams here in the NCAA tournament, but join the bracket challenge, South Point bracket challenge, South Point Studio bracket challenge. Again, the link in the bio of the video and in the live comments, you can compete against Alex, me, Frank Nicotero, Jeff Parles, and just about everybody, both in front of and behind the camera here at South Point Studio. I think that's where you'll see somebody who did their bracket in about two minutes. Beat right. ours, because that's how the, bracket, the brackets work. Yeah. Everybody has the little uh, niece or cousin that just smokes them in the family bracket challenge. And it's interesting. For me, that's been my experience. Not necessarily for you. You're a multi-time contest winner. <laughs> You've won bracket contests in the past. Uh, what is your level of confidence overall in, we'll say, one of your two brackets? I know you've got two that you're kind of toggling between... But in terms of brackets for this year, how, how are you feeling? I feel pretty confident, Matt. Honestly, uh, last year was the best I've done in the bracket. One side was really good. The other side, of course, there was those bracket busters. But I feel good this year. I'm deciding right now because one of them I made, I just went strictly off power ratings and then got to the end and have UConn winning. Um, it's very hard to do that back-to-back. -back. I've been very high on Iowa State all year long, they are in the same region, so I have another bracket where they actually upset UConn, make it to the end there. So I'm deciding on what I want to do. I think I need to stick and go against the power ratings, though, especially in our bracket challenge. Go with Iowa State. I've been talking about them all year long. Everyone in the studio knows that I love the Cyclones, so I think I have to have them as my winner in that one. You got the good futures bet on them as well. I do have a good futures bet on them. You got I'm, a great number. A great number, 50 to 1. A little bit nervous there because they are in that tough region where we have Auburn and Illinois. Um, yeah, that, that East, really, really tough region. Yeah, three of the four uh, final four finalists, I yes. guess, from last year in that bracket. And there's a lot of conference champs kind of grouped into yes, the same there brackets. There's a really, really weird bracket this year, top to bottom. Uh, there's been plenty talked about it. We'll talk a little bit about the bracketology with Matt Verjanic. He's been around the game for over 40 years, so he'll have a thing or two to say, I'm sure. Well, that's what's so fun about this show, right? We get two completely different perspectives. We have Jim Root, who's been following college basketball for a long time and gives out great picks, him and the Weavers, if you follow their podcast. And then we get a coach's perspective. So we're going to tie it all together and get the best information we can out there. Yeah, really excited. Before we bring in Jim Root here in about 10 minutes, wanted to start today's show with two totals, one tomorrow, one today, uh, couldn't be any more different. We're going to start with the highest total in an NCAA tournament game since 2002. It is the only total above 168 since the year 2002, and that is in Alabama and Charleston, a four seed versus a 13 seed. Alabama laying the nine and a half points, but I'm seeing this total as high as 173 and a half. It is the highest in a Sorry, tournament game since 1995, I misspoke. Highest in nearly 30 years. It's the first one to be over 168 even since 2002. And at some books, I've seen the, the handle as high as 91% of the money on the over in that game. So that game's still being bet over. I uh, spoke with Chris Andrews here at South Point about a half hour ago. He says that they're about 75 to 80% okay. of the handle. So still a little bit higher than you would expect. Not quite as high as some other books around town. But what did you make the total in this game on your end? And what are your thoughts on the people still betting it over at 173 and a half? Well, I made it 180, Matt, so I understand the move there while people are betting it over. We have two teams that play really fast, right? Alabama, the 12th fastest in the country. Charleston, the 59th. Um, both really like to move it up the court offensively. So I think we're going to get a lot of back and forth here. I, I would only play the over in this one. And it's funny because... 
when I we were talking about this being the highest total, the first game that came to mind was Alabama Tennessee, and that game did not go over, and it didn't even get anywhere close. But when you look at Alabama's most recent games, they've actually gone over in 11 of their last 12. So they are still on pace to go over these high totals. And, you know, Charleston is just going to put it all out there. It's, uh, you know, biggest game of the year for them. So I would lean to the over still. It's crazy that Alabama has had that many overs as of late, considering that by this time of year, typically the numbers catch up to them. The, the, the books will catch on. They'll start to increase the totals. Uh, but this one, the highest since 1995 in the NCAA tournament, you would have made it even higher. Yes, and I have a chart that was passed down to me from my dad and my grandpa. And so when you make your numbers and you add them together, then you kind of look at this chart. And when it's over a certain number, it, it increases even more. So it's not like a raw number of these two. They're over and, un- over and under together. Um, so it is bumped up a little bit there to help you uh, find the edge on which side you're supposed to be betting. So that definitely increases. But... To your point about Alabama, just played Florida. That total is 175. That went over. Just played Arkansas. That total was set at 175, went over that. So it's not like these were 160s yeah. and they were flying over. The, the numbers have been correct. We saw uh, Kentucky 175 and a half. That one went over. It was that Tennessee game that is stuck in my mind, that 173 that, that went way under. Well, Tennessee, one of the best defenses, not only in the SEC, but in the country. So not terribly surprising that yeah, that's the one that goes right. under for them, but... Yeah, this Alabama team loves to run and gun, as do or as does the College of Charleston. That one at nine and a half, but the total, the notable number at one seventy three and a half. And from you, one end of the spectrum, do you have a feel on that though? Before we get to that other, well, based on you, that trend and your number, I, I, I'd like it over. I would not be surprised to see this one touch one seventy five. This game's not till Friday, also. So I mean, the public loves overs. And this one, a historic over, and people are going to try to fade the the number and just keep on betting that thing up. I, I would not be surprised to see it up to 175. Great point, though. If you do like it over and you want to bet it, bet it now. That Don't wait till time. Friday because you're, you're right. I could see this moving up to at least 175, exactly. closing there yeah, or even higher. Really good. The uh, upset-minded College of Charleston team. I think I think they've got a shot. I think it's going to be a close game. I think Alabama pulls it out. They're uh, 7-1 to to win that region. I think they're live to win that region as well. Uh, but as I was saying, from – one end of the spectrum, all the way down to the other. We got a play-in game between Colorado State and Virginia. That one tonight at six ten here on the West Coast, being played at UD Arena, the University of Dayton. Colorado State, a two and a half point favorite out of the Mountain West, and the total in this one had been as low as one eighteen. It's a little bit up to one twenty one now. People steaming that thing up a couple of points, but when it opened at one eighteen, it was the lowest total in the NCAA tournament since two thousand nineteen. Uh, it was Virginia twice that year that of had course. a total of 118. Um, this one at 121. What, what did you make it? And uh, how upset are you that we have to watch the eyewash that is the Virginia Cavaliers this year? I don't hate Virginia as, as much as most people. I, I actually think they are pretty good. I mean, we saw them really compete in the ACC this year against like really good teams like North Carolina. They hung in that one. So... I actually have them as a a half a point favorite in this one against Colorado State. That is without Isaiah Stevens. We got to check, I mean, at 100%. We still need to check on his status in this one for Colorado State. But I made it 117 and a half. If we can get um, even a little bit higher here, I would love to go under this with these two. Both slow pace. We know that about both of these teams. And this one, the opposite of that Alabama Charleston game. I think if you want to bet the under, you wait. That's right. Because it's been getting steamed up. I think it'll keep going up when people see how low it is compared to the rest of the field. The one note that I have in this one is that Virginia has topped 60 points this year just once against uh, six top 50 defenses. They're 1-5 and to the over when they play a top 50 defense. Colorado State comes in at 38th, so they are within that spectrum. But Colorado State, a lot smaller than those top five, uh, or rather top 50 defenses that Virginia had been playing in the ACC. It's a different caliber of opponent, for better or worse. And with Isaiah Stevens out, I actually think that that that, that speeds the Rams up. He is a uh, floor general, really good in the half court and really, really patient in his fifth year at Colorado State. Um, So we'll see. The the health of Isaiah Stevens is the number or is the thing to watch for in the number in this one. You don't have as much time, though, because this one starts at 6'10 tonight. So he is officially out. He's the out, out. Okay, so yeah, that I mean. Well, I'm asking you, is he out? I don't know. So that's the number. 6'10 tonight. That's what we need to know. Keep an eye. You got three hours, and if we find an update here. While we're on the air, we will definitely let yes. you know. 
Uh, brings a good segue into one of Chris Andrews' favorite things to book here this time of year is the, uh, the, the first to 15 race. And uh, we're getting our first two games of the NCAA tournament tonight. A couple of first four play-in games. And the race to 15 in this one, no surprise, Alex. Colorado State minus 130. And Virginia on the other end laying a dime. Uh, no surprise that Colorado State is a, is a slight favorite in this one. I wouldn't be surprised to see Virginia be the first to 15 if if they're able to stifle this Rams team if Isaiah Stevens does not go. I like it. What's the plus money on that? Uh, plus 110. Plus 110 for yep. Virginia. Okay. So I have never bet the first to 15. I haven't either, yet. but it's one of the markets that intrigues me. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited. I will be here all weekend. Um, we have our shows early, Sports by the Book, Thursday through Sunday at 8.30. So after that show gets done, I will be upstairs watching the games, and I will definitely be betting on some of these first to 15. We'll have Jeff Parles, who loves it, uh, give a little assistance there. And one that I'm definitely going to look for – is fading Iowa State, maybe taking South Dakota State first to 15 in that first game because I've been following Iowa State all year long, and they do start very slow. And, I mean, they're all about defense, especially in that first half of the game. In general, what are your thoughts in this first to 15 race on a lot of the big underdogs? Because we've seen in the past they come out all juiced up, all ready to go, and if you're a high-flying team, like let's just say Western Kentucky, where they run a crazy fast pace, right. they happen to be the fastest team in the country. That's why it popped into my mind. But you get these teams ready to go. They're juiced up against a big-time power opponent, and they come out hot shooting. Is that something that you're going to be looking to take advantage of here in the early rounds? 100%. I think you just um, narrowed it down perfect. I think that is what you should be looking for. We'll get Jim Root's opinion, too, because I know that he uh, bets on these as well. So, I mean, like I said, I've never done it. I, that's where I'm starting off. But if anybody else has any more tips, let us know. Yeah, what a better time than now. Yeah, let us know in the live comments if there's a game that you're going to be looking to bet. A uh, first team to 15 points. Another thing with Western Kentucky is that I'm just generally down on Marquette. We'll see if I'm right or not, but I think that Western Kentucky in that game does get out to a hot start. So that'll be one that I look to get started with immediately. All right, let's bring him in. Yep. we got uh, Jim Root from Three Man Reeve on the line. Jim, thanks a lot for hopping on with us. we got plenty of games uh, to get with you about here while you come on Sports by the Book, but wanted to get your thoughts before we start. Uh, the bracketology, everybody seemingly upset with some seed, some team getting in, some team being left out. What were some of your biggest grievances with the bracket from the committee this year? You know, I was I was less angry about it than I think some people. I wasn't rabble rousing as much as as a lot of folks were. Like I was okay with the Mountain West seeding. I would have probably liked to see another of the Big East teams get in, but uh, quite honestly, I I think by the time I did all my bracketology work, my biggest grievance was Michigan State being in and being outside of the play in games. Uh, I don't think they were consistent in terms of the resume metric stuff they valued for a lot of the other teams. Uh, and the justification they gave about Michigan State having the quad one wins to get them up to a nine seed was was bogus. I mean, you can just look at the facts. They only had three. Plenty of other teams exceeded them, even teams that the, the committee left out or put in the first four. So I don't think they did a great job justifying a lot of the decisions they made that are controversial. And then just including Michigan State there, I, I, I don't really believe they did enough by the end of the year. Yeah, the Big East, I, I think, got jobs. Seton Hall, the only team in the yep. country – to win 13 games in their conference and not win the tournament. If there was one team uh, to get in, it would be either them or uh, uh, there's a couple other that I really thought deserved a shot, um, especially some teams that were higher rated in the metrics, Ken Palm, and, uh, and the net ranking. But we're talking conferences, Jim, and we'll keep it there because you've got a couple of conference props. You think that the Mountain West is going to struggle this year, and you think that the Big 12, with all the teams in, is going to get a ton of wins. Tell us about the bets you've made in the conference prop market. Yeah, so I bet the Mountain West under four and a half wins, and this has kind of been a drum I've been beating for a couple weeks now. So if people who have heard me will probably know this is a narrative I'm pushing, but I just don't think the conference is all that good this year. Um, I know they got six teams in, and they deserve to be there. I I'm not saying dump some of the teams out, but uh, I think they're going to have a little bit of a, a wake-up call in the postseason here. Utah State down the stretch went to Fresno St or went to overtime with Fresno State twice. Uh, San Diego State really got spanked by New Mexico in the in the title game there in the Mountain West tournament. Uh, never truly impressed with Colorado State down the stretch. They were really good back in November and December, but uh, I'm not super optimistic about them, even against Virginia or, or one game later against Texas. 
I think there are some tough draws for a lot of the teams here. You know, San Diego State's the highest seeded team, but UAB's a really tough underdog, a team I've been high on. And uh, I, I think betting on American teams in the postseason, both the NCAA tournament and the, uh, the NIT, is going to be profitable. So I think that's a tough draw for San Diego State. And it's just a historically bad league in the tournament. Over the past 15 years, the Mountain West is 33% against the spread, 23 and 46 I mean, it's for, for that large of a sample size, the, the league to be that bad, I think it tells you that they somehow get a little overvalued in the non-conference, uh, perhaps due to the elevation advantage they have at a lot of their home venues. And they get to these neutral site games, and they're just not that good. So I went under there. And then, yeah, as you mentioned, over in the Big 12, uh, there's a whole bunch of teams in here. And I think they're a little bit the opposite of the Mountain West, where we're going to see them really perform up to the level that uh, you know they've been beating the drum as the best conference in the, in the entire country. And they've got some high seeds that I think will go far with Houston, with Baylor. Uh, I think a couple of the lower seeded teams will at least get one or two wins. TCU uh, head to head against the Mountain West team at Utah State. That's a big one for me for both those bets. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I'm going over on that high number in the Big 12 and under on the, the Mountain West four and a half. Yeah, people forget that outside of last year with San Diego State making that big run, the Mountain West, to your point, Jim, had struggled historically, especially in the last uh, 10 years or so. Well, and in the middle of the season, it was like all these teams are so good, they're beating each other up. And by the end, it was kind of like, I don't know who's the best anymore and if they are really that good or just the same level. So it appears that they are. So I completely understand. And we have Boise State, who actually did very well this year in the conference. They're in a play-in game tomorrow against Colorado. I kind of think the wrong team is favored here, Jim. Boise is minus two and a half. What do you like in this one? I like Colorado a lot. I think this is a really good matchup for them. Uh, two teams that have had the elevation edge all season, uh, and now they're kind of you know, neutralized uh, at, at the site in Dayton for the first four. I just think this is a bad matchup for Boise. It, their whole thing all year has been having a really big front line, three, six, eight guys out there that can attack in the post and really isolate against smaller defenders or guys that just can't hold up strength-wise. That's not going to work against Colorado. They have a huge front line. They start 6'6", 6'8", 6'9", 6'11", up front. They can handle any post-ups. You're not going to be able to pick on them in that regard. And then on the other end, I think Colorado can find ways to score with K.J. Simpson off the bounce. He's terrific in ball screens. And Boise's weakness is at the point guard spot with Roddy Anderson coming over from UC San Diego. So I, I just think with the way Colorado's getting healthier, you know, Cody Williams, the potential lottery pick, is back healthy in the lineup. And combined with the matchup, I think the Buffs are a great bet on Wednesday night. Yeah, I'm actually with you, Jim. I laid the 140 uh, on the money line with the Buffs. It's a team that I've seen in person. They're big. They're fast. Uh, they play really well as a unit now. When I saw them play earlier this season against Richmond, it was not quite the case. But I was I remember being in awe of you know how big and fast they were, especially for a, a Thad Boyle coach team. One area, too, in this game that I, I think that they'll have a big advantage in, Boise State's biggest deficiency defensively is guarding against cuts and in transition. Those are two of the things that the Buffaloes do really well. So I'm with you on that, Jim. I, I laid the money line just to take the guesswork out of it at, at 140. We had our, uh, our bracket shows yesterday between Punchlines and, and Sports by the Book, and one thing that uh, Jeff Parles had mentioned is that his hardest game to pick, just as far as, you know, as teams that he really didn't have a strong feel on either way, was the matchup between South Carolina and Oregon. You've got to play on this game. Uh, tell us why you like the Ducks against the Cox. Yeah, I love Oregon here. It's just a team that's usually really good in the postseason under Dana Altman. He's 15 and six against the spread in postseason or in uh, NCAA tournament games. Just seemingly always makes a run when he gets here. And I think a big part of that is because of his kind of funky changing defenses. They're really, really hard to prepare for. I think Pac-12 teams that see it twice a year can kind of figure it out uh, and. But, but that wasn't really the case in the Pac-12 tournament. Obviously, he started to use it more. They played 220 zone possessions this year, and 60 of them were in the Pac-12 tournament over those three games. That's that's all like, you know, a big portion of them compared to the rest of the year. Now they get in against uh, South Carolina, a team that's a pretty good man-to-man -man offense because they can invert the floor with, uh, with a big man that can shoot and B.J. Mack and some guards that can get downhill. But against the zone, I think it'll kind of trip them up a little bit, and it is – changing zones it's not going to be the same thing every time it can keep them off balance and of course south carolina is the second lowest rated at-large team in the entire uh field per ken palm only virginia is lower 
I, I just think Oregon might actually be a little bit better in terms of talent and combine that with Altman's wizardry in the postseason. I, I'm going with the Ducks there, and I think they make a run uh, to the Sweet 16 or Elite Eight. Wow. And I was actually on Colorado against the Ducks, and they were very impressive in that championship game. And wishful thinking that I, Colorado, we were actually getting points against Boise. They are the favorite, just not big enough. So I'm with you both on that one. But I'm a big totals better, and you have two for us. So let's get started on that. Drake versus Washington State. Drake is a small one-and-a-half point favorite in that one. Total here at South Point, 137-and-a-half. You like this over or under, Jim? I'm going under. I think both these teams can kind of find ways to stop what the other one wants to do. Uh, Drake's really reliant on their star, Tucker DeVries. He's the son of the coach, big-time shot maker, 6'7", kind of matchup problem. He can shoot over smaller defenders or bully those guys or pull bigs out to the perimeter. But I think he's got some tough matchups with Washington State. They've got a bunch of huge wings. Jalen Wells is 6'8", Yakimovsky's 6'8". Uh, Kimani Hunsu is 6'7". They've got guys that can throw at him that can athletically compete. So that sort of short circuits their best option. And then the other end, you know, Washington State is gigantic. They like to bully you on the offensive glass, but Drake's the best defensive defensive rebounding team in the country by rate. So they're not going to give up a lot of second chances. They're going to play a lot of drop coverage and pick and roll, force uh, Washington State to score off the bounce. And they've really only got one shot creator. That's Miles Rice. And they've got a, Drake's got a lot of little pesty defenders that they can throw at him, uh, Connor and Wright and, and Colby Garland. So I think both teams are going to really – get bogged down in the half court. It'll slow down a little bit with the the stakes of the postseason and both teams playing big lineups. I think we'll just see an inefficient battle there. I like that under. Yeah, this is one where I actually got a great line. I bet Drake nice and early at uh, plus one. And the the line is flipped. They're now one and a half point favorite. So I I think I bet probably six or seven of these first round games uh, early just to take advantage of of some lines that that move as they always do. You're on Drake. Laying the one and a half, and you like the under in that game as well against Washington State. The Cougars, good story. I don't think they've done enough to prove it come tournament time. Drake is a team with some tournament experience, especially uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, From an under to an over, pretty elevated total between Kansas and Samford. I think that the Jayhawks certainly should be on upset watch. Samford, a really, really fast pace. They run and gun it. Uh, The total 134 or 154 and a half. It was 153 and a half yesterday, so this is a number that's getting bet up. Do you still like it over, even with the point adjustment up to 154 and a half? I do, yeah. Even from the, the openers on Sunday, this has been up like three or four points. People clearly seeing something similar, hopefully, to what I am. I just think it's going to get up and down. Samford, their identity is, is bucky ball, bucky pressure. They want to get up into you, force turnovers, use that to fuel their transition offense going the other way. And I was there, excuse me, not Wisconsin, almost said Wisconsin. Kansas <laughs> is going to take advantage of that. Uh, they are a team that if you pressure them, they will they will abuse you. It's not like, a, oh, just get it over the half court line and, and settle down. They're going to go get dunks and layups. Uh, they've got three great passers in Dewan Harris, Kevin McCuller, KJ Adams. I think they're going to be healthy enough and those guys can pass over the top of the pressure and, and they'll beat it and be willing to play an up tempo game against pressure. And so I, I think we see a lot of possessions. Uh, and a lot of points on both ends of the floor. Jim, you guys have been very busy. And before I ask my next next question, go ahead, tell everybody where they can find you. I know you guys recorded your latest podcast uh, going into this weekend. Yeah, we do a a March Madness Marathon every single year. It's our favorite episode on our Three Man Weave podcast feed. Just search that, uh, Three Man Weave. We, We go two hours breaking down every single game. You know, these quick blurbs I'm giving on each one, you get more and more of that, all these stats and stuff. It's it's true nerdery on college hoops. And we watch all these teams all season long. I've seen every one of the teams in this tournament play probably at least five times. So uh, a lot of good eye test nuggets, some statistical stuff. Definitely worth checking that out. We do a best bet show, too, on our YouTube channel. So uh, that that's more truly the gambling filter for it all. Check that out for some more picks and, and betting angles. Definitely great information. I have tuned into a few. I also saw you guys on the field of 68. And in that one, I'm very interested to get your thoughts because in that East region, I think a lot of people are kind of having trouble there, me included. Four really good teams that can make it out of there. Of course, we have the defending champions, UConn. Not one of you picked UConn to come out of that region. And we've got odds here. Um, who did you pick in the East region? And then we'll go ahead and throw up the odds. So, yeah, initially, as we did that bracket reaction Sunday night, I ended up with Illinois, and I have since rethought. Okay. So, you know, that's the disadvantage of having to quickly do it. Uh, but I'm still not going UConn. I, I'm, uh, I'm going with Auburn coming out of there. 
I think it's just a, a, a kind of a tough situation to repeat for UConn. Uh, they got a really, really difficult draw. You mentioned it. Uh, just a, the best four seed, the best two seed in the bracket by Ken Palm. Illinois is scorching hot and a, a terrific offense. And even just potentially Florida Atlantic or Northwestern, I think, can give them a game in the second round. So, yeah, I have Auburn going on a run there out of that four seed spot. I'm not too worried about the five or the 12. I think Yale's a really poor matchup for Auburn, given how they want to score at the rim. And Auburn's got probably the best rim defense in the entire country. Uh, so their athleticism, their confidence of their guards, they're playing a lot better lately. I think Bruce Pearl's kind of figured out the right rotation. They, they were try, trying a bunch of different lineups throughout the year, and now it seems like they've kind of hit their stride. And they've got the athleticism, the defense, to compete with UConn in that Sweet 16 game. So I have them pulling off the upset and then eventually beating Iowa State in the Elite Eight. That's where I, I switched on Illinois. I just don't think Illinois' defense is good enough. I overreacted at first, but uh, I got the Cyclones going to the Elite Eight. They're out of the bottom half of that bracket, using their defensive pressure and, and kind of a rejuvenated offense, or at least a little bit better, uh, probably Otzelberger's best since he's been in Ames. Like, then getting to the Elite Eight and, and falling to Auburn for the Final Four berth. Uh, UConn right now at South Point, plus 110 to win that region. Auburn at 4-1 to one behind them. So if you follow Jim Root, you will like the Tigers uh, laying the 4-1 to one there. I want to go from the east to the west. It was the one region that we really didn't get to touch on a lot on either of our two shows yesterday where we broke down the bracket just for time's sake. UNC the one seed, Arizona the two seed. In my initial bracket that I filled out that I'm going to adjust before we uh, do our tournament challenge that the fans can get in on, on our link, links in our bio, links in the live comments of this video, the initial bracket I did, guys, I have Arizona winning it all. Um, I think that they are really big, really strong, really fast, obviously really well coached, but I think the odds tell you something. Right now, looking at the w odds to win the West region here at South Point, North Carolina at 3-1. to one. Arizona actually even opened with better odds than them at plus 220. And then in the national title odds, Arizona's 10-1, to one, North Carolina's 12-1. to one. UNC with the wins, Jim, obviously deserves the one seed, and they snuck in there at the last moment with Tennessee falling uh, in the SEC tournament. In your eyes, if you had a $100 free bet that somebody handed you a, a Benjamin. Are you going with UNC or are you going Arizona to win the national championship at this point pre-tournament? I would go Arizona. I think you're, I think you're spot on there uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they've got the better geographical draw. You know, they're going to be out West for this, this region, probably have a little bit of a crowd advantage. Not that UNC fans won't get out there. I know they travel well and, and will be in a house, but Arizona has got a little bit easier uh, perspective on that. And then, I just like their draw, too, from the bracket sense. I would much rather play the winner of Dayton and Nevada in the second round mm -hmm. than Michigan State and Mississippi State. I think both of the 8-9 teams are better than both of the 7-10 seven te uh, teams. So a little bit easier route to the Sweet 16. Once they're there, it's out west. They've got a geographical advantage over whether it's Baylor or somebody making a, a dark horse run out of the 6-11 game. It's a pretty decent draw for Arizona relative to North Carolina at that one seed. It's almost like Carolina would have been better off being like number six overall and being in the South region and being a lot closer to home. But it's the price of winning too many games, I guess. I guess, yeah. Tough, tough problem to have. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Jim, we're looking forward to it. We're going to have you, Matt, and Kai all here at the South Point watching games with us. Um, I do have to ask you are the spinner hats going to make it to Vegas? And what's the story behind those? Oh, they 100% will be there. The spinny <laughs> hats will, will make the trip. Uh, for some reason, we just, you know, we, we wore them one year out there on a trip before we even started our show, our podcast. Uh, we, we said anytime we made a bet that the public was making, we called it a spinny bet, and we put our spinny hats on and, and did that. And it has uh, a tradition that has stuck to this day. So we will be very recognizable out there. Uh, and I, by the way, I heard you guys talking first to 15. Oakland against Kentucky is my favorite first Ooh, to 15 bet. I, I like that, that one. Yes. I don't mind that one at all, especially with the Kentucky's defense or lack thereof. Yes, exactly. And they don't start Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham. Like, they don't play their best lineup to start. I think I think there's some vulnerability there. Okay. That is interesting. That is an interesting point. But from a, a bracketology perspective, uh, from the brackets that you filled out, if you wouldn't mind divulging your, your favorite Final Four, who do you have uh, and what's your championship matchup at this point? I have got Houston over Auburn in the final. I, if, I wish Houston was still fully healthy. I wish JoJo Tugler hadn't gotten hurt down the, down the stretch there. But I, I think their region's kind of soft, so it's a little bit of a probability play there that I think they're most likely to get to the final four. And I have Auburn in the final. Um, I'm debating between Baylor and Arizona down in that, that west region that we just discussed. For, right now I have Baylor there. 
uh, we'll probably end up blocking that in as my final pick. And then I have Purdue making the final four, kind of quieting some of the doubters that say they're going to get upset all the time. And, uh, you know, a little bit of redemption from last year going down to a 16 seed. I had them emerging from that bracket that is basically all the Maui Invitational, Kansas, Gonzaga, Tennessee, all those teams played in Maui back in November. Purdue won that tournament. I think they win the the tournament of the Midwest region and get to the final four this year. Yeah, I saw your, your tweet on that last night. I thought that was that was pretty funny. Uh, Houston right now, 5-1 to one to win everything behind us here at the South Point. Joined here on Sports by the Book by Jim Root of the Three Man Weave. And Jim, the NCAA tournament, the big dance, not the only tournament going on right now. Have you got a chance to really look at Handicap, take a, an eye on any of these NIT matchups that start uh, that start tomorrow? Or to today, rather? Uh, no, yeah, not super in detail. I did fill out a bracket just, just before we got on air, actually. I picked South Florida to win it all, a team I saw in person this year that is trending way, way up from what they were early in the season. And I think that's the kind of team that's like very motivated still to – to play through that tournament. And again, I think betting on the American, that conference in postseason tournaments is going to be profitable. Uh, an early round matchup I like is Appalachian State at Wake Forest to keep it close. Underdog there, really good rim defense. And I, I, to me, it seems like Wake's going to be a little more deflated by not making the big dance than someone like App State, who should be, uh, you know, happy to continue playing basketball at this point. Hey, Jim, I, I liked you already. Always been a big fan <laughs> of the work you guys do with the three man weave. You just earned a fan for life, App State, my alma mater. So I'm, I'm on the Mountaineers as well. I think that's a really good bet. You mentioned South Florida. That is a game that Alex had been keeping an yes. eye on. One of the couple that you had taken a look at in the NIT, and you kind of said the same thing, the South Florida team surging at the right time. And the motivation, always an interesting factor to account for, not only in the NCAA tournament, but maybe even more so in, in the NIT. And the South Florida team comes in buoyed with confidence. Absolutely, I agree. And I'd like to get Jim's thought. What about Ohio State? Do you think they will be motivated? I mean, they were getting hot at the right time. They almost made it to the tournament, couldn't quite get there. But do you think they'll be interested in this NIT tournament? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I, I can't remember if I had them in the final four or the final of the bracket I just filled out here. It might be taken on South Florida in that championship. But I, I think back to, I think maybe two years ago when Xavier fired Travis Steele and they were coached by an interim coach and went on a big run in the NIT. They went to the final four at Madison Square Garden. And I know Jake Diebler has gotten that head job and got a very cushy, I think it's a five year deal in charge of Ohio State. I still think it just seems like this team likes playing for him. Uh, the guys have rallied together. They got out of a little bit of the rut that they were in, kind of losing close games late under Chris Holtman. So I, I do think they're going to keep trying to, to play as long as they possibly can. And it's a very talented team, like yes. a preseason top 25, top 30. So if they trend back up to that level, I, I think that's a team that can go far in the NIT. Always interesting to see. And then uh, one last one, just because it's the, uh, the local tie, obviously. UNLV in New Jersey taking on Princeton. Uh, an injury concern for the Rebels, Caleb Boone, who missed the final game of the Mountain West tournament. And there is uh, another outside, uh, or rather player not playing, Luis Rodriguez, who is the leading rebounder for this team uh, in just about all their games this year, not playing due to a uh, family issue. Uh, the two rebounders being out for UNLV, I think, should have moved the line. It has not yet. Do you have any kind of handicap on this one? Because you know, generally speaking, what you're going to get from Princeton is not necessarily about the personnel. It's more about the scheme. Yeah, their scheme's terrific. They have no depth. They play five guys. If you get anybody <laughs> in foul trouble, they're, they're in real, you know, that's what happened to them in the semis against Brown in the Ivy tournament. Caden Pierce went out, and they kind of went down the drain early in the first half before climbing all the way back. It's just a terrible draw for UNLV having to go across the country 48 hours after this bracket was announced. At UNLV all season was awesome at home against the top of the Mountain West. They they played with or beat basically every team that's in the NCAA tournament. I This is one where I'm a little worried about the incentive to go all the way to New Jersey and play a team that's going to break you down with a really patient offensive approach. And now they're shorthanded. Rodriguez is a great defender, too. I, I kind of like Princeton there, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I hate to say it. I'm with you there, too, especially with the injuries. If those two guys were playing, it'd be a totally different contest in my eyes. Right. But we'll see. Keep an eye on Caleb Boone. He may or may not play this game tomorrow night at 5 here on the West Coast. Luis Rodriguez out due to a family issue, uh, and that, that is going to be a, a big detriment to UNLV. But Jim Root of the three-man weave, we will let you run. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for giving out some plays. And, uh, yeah, have fun. Can't wait to spin that propeller on top of your guys' hat when we uh, see you guys this weekend. <laughs> We'll do. It's going to be a blast. Yeah, we got Wagner about to tip off right let's now. Go, Wagner baby. and Howard. So let's do it. The madness has arrived. Let's do it. We'll, we'll let you take off and watch it so you can say that you were able to watch every minute of every game in the tournament. 
Beautiful. Thank you. Appreciate there he it. Goes. Thank Jim you, Jim Root of Three Man Weave. Always love what the uh, what the weavers have to say. Jim, one of the best when it comes to taking a look at the what did he say? College basketball nerdery. Yeah. Nerdery. That's that that's right up our alley. That's exactly what we like here on Sports by the Book. I also like that he was on a lot of the same uh, sides that I was. Yeah, that always feels good, right? Always feels good. And I like how he said the eye test, plus we always have the statistical, and I think that sums them up very well. Well, let's take a look at the game that he had just mentioned. It was one that we hadn't brought up yet. It's the first game of the NCAA tournament. We are five minutes away from the madness. We've made it, Alex. Wagner <laughs> and Howard, our first game, 689, 670 on the betting rotation. Alex, this is a game that you had a different opinion on than, than some other folks, uh, but now the market kind of catching up to you. Uh, the game at some places opened Wagner laying the two, uh, Howard now laying the two, and all the way up to three actually here at the South Point behind us, and a total of 128. What was your initial handicap on this one? Turns out you were right. Everybody f- moving in your direction number-wise. Well, to be honest, I kind of grabbed the teams that I thought could make the tournament, and then I ranked them right. These two were the bottom two, Matt, of the 72 that I had in there to see who was going to make that before we got our the final draw on Sunday but I did have Howard as a two-point favorite here I think it's kind of getting a little bit aggressive here with three because they really aren't too far apart right Howard just a little bit better but Wagner they did win three in a row in the Northeast Conference to get to this spot they lost four out of five before that in the regular season so this team not all that good Howard on the other side 19th best three-point shooting team in the country so that's what I was looking at maybe that's a good uh, first to 15 but they are the favorite in that one you're I think we're looking for more plus money with that bet so yeah I think Howard is the right side here I, I do think they should be the favorite and um that 19th best three-point shooting. That's what they're going to have to uh, live off of in this yeah, in this playing game. Especially early on, yeah. Taking a look at the first of 15, as you mentioned, Howard Lang, the 130. I think that's the only play. I got no eyes for the plus 110 going the other way. Take a look at Wagner. They run the 361st slowest tempo in the country. There's only one team that runs a slower tempo than them, and it is Virginia, and we hate Virginia on this show. <laughs> I, I do. Uh, the the I watch that is the Virginia Cavaliers at least this year. Generally, I'm a fan. of You and Jeff Parles. We'll, Good we'll, team. We'll, so yeah, it's fair. Sports by the book is two to one. They do. Wagner also hasn't played anybody. 352nd no. in terms of strength of schedule. They are 333rd in terms of offensive efficiency. So you might actually be getting a good number on that first to 15 race with Howard uh, at minus 130. Yeah, I agree. And Howard, they won six of their last eight leading up to this game so I mean I think they are the the hotter team even though Wagner did have to win three to get here but overall yes I would say Howard is the way to go and the first half total in this game of 58 and a half and I still lean under yeah I agree (laughs) with a grand total of 127 in the game yeah I uh I probably will not watch this game even when we get off the air uh, winner of this one taking on North Carolina, so it's the battle to see who will get uh, shellacked by the Tar Heels, who are playing well coming into this time of year. Uh, yeah, that's our first game of the tournament, Colorado State-Virginia, coming up at 6-10. The only play-in game that we have not mentioned so far is tomorrow afternoon at 3.40 on Impractical Joker's channel, I mean True TV, um, Grambling great and Montana show. State. I love Impractical Joker. I do, too. It's, that's a great show. I will say, a, a little sidebar here. It is the one week a year when people actually watch True TV. It is the best marketing plan that the Turner Broadcasting System could have ever thought of to get people to uh, find just what channel it is and then keep it there all year. That's true. That's a great point. And it is a, it's a fantastic show. But they did lose someone, right? It's, there was four. Uh, Joe. Joe is no longer Joe with Gatto, them. Joe no and longer. he was um, arguably the funniest he of was, the bunch. He, see, I think they're all funny. I am a... Uh, I'm a Q guy. Yeah. I like Q. He, Joe, they, 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 they track this. They kept track of how many challenges they had won and lost. Joe, by far, had the best winning percentage. Well, because he was very dry, right? And he could do all the jokes and all the challenges yeah. without even breaking a smile. So, yeah, I believe that 100%. I would have bet on him if he gave me um, the option. Yeah. <laughs> uh, True TV hosting this game at 340 tomorrow here on the West Coast. Just real quick, if you have any thoughts, Montana, Grambling State, you got anything on this game? I really don't. I think that number is just right. I think Montana State should be a small favorite in this one, but I don't feel that confident laying the three and a half with them. I liked Montana State over Montana. It's one I had over Jeff Parles, which I have to brag because it's it's few. Um, but <laughs> yeah, now that we've got to this point, I, I really have no feel for this these two. Hey, take them when you can get them over That's Jeff, right. right? That's right. That is funny. Well, we'll step aside. Take a brief two-minute break. 
When we return, Matt Frigianic, former college head coach, joins to talk about what it's like to coach in the NCAA tournament and some of his thoughts on the seating and the bracket overall. Don't go anywhere. Sports by the Book back in 120 seconds. From the South Point studio. The perfect blend of sports. But I think the Niners are going to wear them down. Detroit Pistons lost their 36 games. A comedy. It's the over-under on that relationship lasting. I'm going to put mayo in the coffee. Yes. Yes. I am beautiful. And a whole lot of Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. 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 Yeah. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. Join Ryan McCormick. That's at least two picks outside of our own in the first round next year. Oreo. And host Frank Nicotero. <laughs> <laughs> Do I look at the clock? I go, ah! Ah! Oh! Watch Punchlines live at noon every weekday. Once you've satisfied your hunger, get ready for more of the hottest casino games in Vegas. Our 24-hour, 30-table non-smoking poker room proudly hosts all the most popular poker games with a variety of betting limits. Visit the poker room for a schedule of daily tournaments. Whether you're going to hold them or fold them, the best place for poker is at South Point Casino. You'll notice that our craps tables are usually the loudest in the casino. If you've never played, join one of our free craps lessons to find out what makes this game so exciting. Check with the craps dealer for schedules and give it a roll. Bingo is also an exciting way to spend your time. We offer seven sessions of bingo every day. And each session includes a cash ball jackpot, 12 bingo games, a progressive double action game, and a $10,000 bonus coverall. Electronic units are available. If you haven't played bingo with us, give it a try today. Guests can also get in on the action at our one-of-a-kind race and sports books. Two separate rooms designed to maximize your experience and comfort. Our sports book, with over 400 seats, puts you right in the middle of the action, 24 hours a day. Welcome back into Sports by the Book here at the South Point studio, along with Alex White. I'm Matt Never joined now on the show by another guy with a fantastic first name as former college head basketball coach Matt Ferjanic joins us. Matt, thanks for coming on, and uh, we want to get your thoughts because you've got plenty of experience. Coach at Robert Morris, Marist, Pitt Greensburg, Polk State for almost 20 years down in Florida, and you took three teams to the NCAA tournament, including Robert Morris twice, Marist once. It was the first ever tournament appearance for Bobby Moe, as they are affectionately known up in Coriopolis, just outside of Pittsburgh. A couple of Pittsburgh guys going at it here on Sports by the Book. In your experience, before we get into this year's tournament or any specifics, is there anything that changes from a coach's perspective, from a player's perspective, even from program-wide? What is different about playing in an NCAA tournament game, even in the biggest game of anybody's regular season? The, the number one thing that changes is the exposure you get, uh, especially if you're from one of the smaller mid-level conferences. Every game is an on-sports center at night. Your score is mentioned sometimes, but there's not the buildup. And it's a change because, you know, you're all of a sudden you win your conference tournament. You're the king of the hill. You receive all this national exposure. We were Robert Morris. We made the headlines of USA Today. The headline was Bobby Knight versus Bobby who. So, <laughs> you know, our, that was really the, the coming out party for our program. And you try not to change too much. You know, you're trying to keep your kids level headed, even though they're going to be getting calls from friends that they haven't heard from for years. Um, you know, everyone wants their attention. They're going to be the Kings of campus. You just try to keep them focused that this is a, just another game we're going to play. It sure has a lot more exposure and importance, maybe other games we play, but nothing is more important than the conference championship game. After that, it's you enjoy the ride. The The conference championship game is what you build for, especially, you know, we were at both the Robert Morris and Maris. We were part of the one bid, bid leagues. So if, if you lose the conference tournament, whether you win a regular season or not, you're out. Right. You know, back then we didn't get in the NIT. So it was all or nothing. And, you, you try to approach each game as just have fun. Do what you have with each other for the 26, 27 games we play during the year. Enjoy the moment. Give it your energy. There's no tomorrow. And just do the best job you can, and let's see what we can do 
one game at a time. Then all of a sudden you win a tournament and bam, you're, you're the king of the hill for a couple of days. You walk around campus and we should read all the media, but you try to keep them focused. You know, the main thing is this next game is just another game towards the ultimate goal. My for Our first year in, I talked to the, about this story once before on, on this show. We didn't really, I man, as a coach, my Robert Morris team, I probably didn't prepare them correctly. We were just so happy to be in that we, you know, we enjoyed it, you know, and we, you know, we went to the game. Well, we're just giving it our best shot. The second year we made it, we had a play-in game against Georgia Southern, and we played them earlier in the year. So we were on a mission to win that game. And then after that, we played Purdue, and we were on a mission to win that game also. We lost by a shot with about three seconds left. Steve Reed with the buzzer. And in fact, Coach Katie and I talked about this, the game, about two weeks ago. I was able to get reach out to him and – we had a nice conversation, but the, the number one thing, especially for all the teams in it now, is you want to keep your players as level-headed as possible, stay away from distractions, not to get wrapped up in the exposure, don't watch ESPN, don't watch all the shows, don't watch all the predictions. Just worry about how you're going to prepare and play, and let's have fun together, our family, our team, our unit, and you know, let's just do everything we can because this is going to be a moment that we're going to remember the rest of our lives. Matt, everybody loves a Cinderella team to go on a deep run in the tournament. What do you think is a, a common similarity between some of these Cinderella teams that we've seen in the last decade or so? The ball goes in the hoop more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to, I, that's the only thing I can think of. I, I don't think it's preparation. Um, all teams going relaxed. All teams going excited. You get some players who just get a hot hand. And that carries you over, especially if you're in the game early. And then you realize, man, by halftime, wow, we're right in here. You know, we we have a shot at this team. And 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 I think there's more pressure on the higher seeded team because they're coming in with higher expectations. The Cinderella teams are going in with low expectations. No one expects them to reach the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight or even the, you know, after – 64 teams in round of 32. If you win, you're once again, you got that win like you did in a conference tournament. Let's celebrate it and get ready for the next game where you might get some of the um, higher seeded teams looking a game or two ahead. So once you ha have a team, you, you see it with any athletes. All these players are good nowadays. They were good back then. We have players on our Robert Morris teams that you know could have played for some of those major college teams. Maybe not, you know, all, all five together, but they sure could have, you know, played a role, especially with the other teams locally. We had in Pittsburgh and Tri-State area, and then in Maris, of course, you know, I have Rick Smith and I have a great guard draft in Davis, and we had a great backup group. So, you know, you're you're in it, and all of a sudden you, you get that taste, and you go, listen, we can play with them. All right, here we are at halftime now. Okay, what did it take to get us here? We're only 20 minutes away, but we played 20 minutes already, and look what we did. Actually, I think there's more pressure on the higher seeded teams than there are the lower seeded teams to 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 get that win. And you know that's why you know sometimes you play a lot more freely when you have less pressure. You know your shots more relaxed. You're you know you're not afraid to go out and hey, I roughed this kid up. He didn't beat me up. There's an official on the court. You know, hey, I banged him underneath. I gave him an elbow. Damn, he's he didn't beat me up. So you know those guys you see on TV all year. All of a sudden, hey, here I am. You know, I'm not afraid of him. So, so it's kind of like that, that emotion carries you through. I'm joined here on Sports by the Book by Matt Frajanic. 40 years as a head coach, as a coach in general, 35 of them as a head coach, a lot of them in the Pittsburgh area, and wanted to get your thoughts on a, a pair of Pittsburgh-based teams, one in, one out. We'll start with the Pitt Panthers, who were excluded from the tournament. A lot of folks, including our very own Frank Nicotero, for obvious reasons, thought that they should have been in. Your thoughts on Pitt's exclusion from the tournament and just the selections in general, because this year the bracket seems very, very wonky for a lot of reasons. Well, you know, to, to get back to Pitt, of course, being from Pittsburgh, I'm, I'm a hometown guy. Steelers, Pirates, Pitt, Duquesne, Robert Morris. So I should say Steelers, Pirates, Robert Morris. Yeah. Then Duquesne, Slack. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I mean, Pitt just finished up after they beat Duke on the road. They had a great finish. And, you know, I mean, I'm looking at the two words now, net and quadrant. 
you, I mean, you have to be a statistician. I, I, don't, I don't understand what they are. I don't take math anymore. To figure those, you know, formulas out and everything they're using. One, one of the formulas I really do not like is, you know, the, the difference of the score at the end of a game. You know, how much you win by or how much you lose by. I think that's going to just open up a can of worms because you're going to have coaches down the road now saying, well, wait a minute, I'm not taking my subs out. I'm not putting the, the senior in that deserves to play or the eighth, ninth guy on a bench with 10 minutes going. We're up by 18. Let's get up by 25 because maybe that will be more important in the, in the eyes of the, the people who do the seating. But Pitt, no doubt, had a great finish. Coach Capel did a great job there this year. Um, he had young players to – blend in with a couple veterans. Of course, Henson was a superstar for them, clutch player at the end, and then you take Lowe and Carrington and some others. And, I mean, it was just a great blend. He did a great job. And to, to finish in the ACC and getting the road wins that they did at Duke, at Virginia, um, and then they took care of business at home. So you take away the, the early schedule and maybe the one loss of Wake Forest, and I don't think there's anybody in the country that probably had, a, had as good as a – there's a record in January or February, then, or I shouldn't say not, not many teams did like, like Pitt did. So, so back here, we're, we're all disappointed you know, I, about, about the committee. I'm with you. I had um, Pitt like third or fourth in the ACC just behind North Carolina and Duke. I don't even know if I had anybody above them. But, yeah, I was hoping they got in, too. I really enjoyed watching them, especially down the end of the stretch. But I want to ask you about that other team that Matt – brought up as well and Duquesne won four in a row to win the Atlantic 10 beat VCU in the championship game 11 seed how do you feel about that their first matchup the six seed in uh, BYU Cougars well I'll tell you what it is the first NCAA tournament since 1977 for Duquesne and I'm going back to the 50s and 60s when Duquesne in Pittsburgh was more respected than than the Pitt basketball oh, yeah. team Duquesne the team. They were the team making the tournaments, being in the NIT every year. And that 1977 team, Norm Nixon was the leader of that team. A former player of mine in high school, General Braddock, Jeff Baldwin was the top sub coming off the bench. So I followed that team very closely. That was my last year of high school basketball before I went to Robert Morrison's assistant. But I was a big fan that year. I knew Norm Nixon well. Norm is a great guy. We worked, we actually worked at a summer basketball Little league together at camp that was sponsored by Allegheny County. And I mean, Norm was magic, and, and that whole team had, you know, a lot of Pittsburgh players on it. So did the Pitt team in 1974, which was, you know, they took that picture from Mount Washington, Pittsburgh, where I think it was eight, eight members of that team were from Pittsburgh. So it, it, they were an exciting team to, to watch this year. They had their run in the tournament, they did what they needed to do. It was. And, and that's that's what you do. You get that run, you get hot, you get that confidence. You 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 win a game against Dayton, and they, next thing you know, hey, we beat Dayton. Now we have everyone else coming up that we know we definitely can compete against. So you have to give Coach Dambro a lot of credit. Um, his father played at Duquesne, so I'm sure it was very very emotional for him to you know win that game after all these years with Duquesne not being in the tournament. So that was very exciting. Last time the Dukes went dancing, they were booging to Tonight's the Night by Rod Stewart, the number one song in 1977, the last time that they went to the NCAA tournament. Uh, Matt, before we finish up here, did you get a chance to fill out a bracket or take a look at one yet? Yeah, I have it here. Oh, boy. Then let's get into it. Who is in your, your, your final let's, four? Let's put this way. Yeah. Who in the world did not fill out a bracket? True. Nobody okay. that I want to be associated with. <laughs> they have a couple more days. Well, a day. You got, you got time. You're running out of time if you haven't yet, yes. but get on it right now. All right, Matt, who's your final four, your championship matchup, and who do you have cutting down the nets at the end of everything? Well, you always go with a couple upsets, right? And um, I have Illinois in my final four Ooh. over UConn. Just because I, I I coached against Coach Brad Underwood when I was at Polk State in Florida, and he was a coach at Daytona State College um, in the junior college ranks, region region eight in Florida, and we were, we have a great region, great competition. So I know Brad Post uh, personally. I think Arizona is playing the best basketball in the land. I and, and, you know one thing I want to compliment you guys on early in the show. You're talking about the over underline on points, and I'm not a gambler. But I tell you what, I've never seen points scored like they were this year. Right. You take those SEC games where 
Kentucky and Tennessee and some of those other play. I mean, you know, I don't know if the scoreboard can hold enough points with some of these things nowadays. <laughs> so, so you're going to see a lot of fast-paced basketball. I have Houston um, as, a, as an old coach. I just like the idea of Calvin Sampson, you know, getting his opportunity. He's done a lot for coaching. He's been a great coach for many years. So, you know, I'm hoping he gets to the final four and gets his chance. And then I, how, how can, how can anybody, how can anybody go against Kansas every year in the NCAA? <laughs> They've had so much success year in and year out. So, so I have Illinois, Arizona, Houston, Kentucky, um, Houston, Kansas. I mean, so, um, I know I'm slighting some people and hope I don't make any enemies in coach profession I haven't made already. But um, <laughs> just from, you know, my point of view, that's kind of who I'm, who I'm leaning towards. I like it. That's our second guest out of two today that's liked Arizona to get all the way to the Final Four, as I like as well. I've got the Wildcats at least for now until I finalize my bracket tonight uh, winning the whole thing. So, yeah, great first name, Matt. Great bracket. I like it. I, love, I like it a lot. Um, Matt Frigenic. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, that's yes. the beauty of the bracket is you can do all the research and then it'll all go to hell within the first first weekend anyway. So, uh, but yeah, Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, exactly. Might as well rip it up now. The uh, the Region 8 Hall of Famer down there in the JUCO ranks in Florida, Matt Forjanic joins us. Uh, 40 years in coaching, 35 plus years as a head coach, and a, a pretty good Final Four. Four teams that I had not, not necessarily heard mixed together yet, but right. I don't hate any of them, hate any of the reasonings. Um, and then who do you have winning it all, Matt, out of those four? I have Houston. Houston, okay. Old veteran. Um, I think Brad Underwood's going to get another chance, but Kelvin Sampson, he's done so much for basketball, so much for our organization, the NABC, National Association of Basketball Coaches. So, I mean, that's just, that's just you know, from the, from the heart. I'm just hoping Kelvin Sampson gets that opportunity and gets a cut down the net. And defense wins championships, right? Yes, it, yes, it does. Yes. Hey, Matt. Yes. Before, so I, I give them a little bit of an advantage there. They're yeah. going to, they're going to attack you. Hey, before so, we let you go, uh, we got your old buddy Chris Andrews on set. He's got a, he's, he's got a question for you. Oh, I just want to thank Matt for coming on. Uh, you know, great to get a coach's uh, perspective on all this stuff. I mean, not too often you get that. And so, uh, Matt, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm really rooting for Duquesne. You know, when I was a kid, we'd go to all the games. I mean. I, I, we go to Pitt on Saturday, down to the field house, watch all the, uh, you know, the public schools, the state schools. And then on Sunday, we'd go down to the arena, and we got to see all the Catholic schools, you know, the Villanova and LaSalle. Even I remember Detroit coming in with Spencer Haywood. It was a great, great growing up in that era. And, of course, Matt uh, coached a little while at my old high school. So, oh wow, Woody High! Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, Woody High. So, uh, Matt, I'm, I'm going to try to get to Pittsburgh this summer. Maybe we'll go grab a sandwich or something somewhere, buddy. How's that sound? Love that, Chris. And you, know, like you said, Saturday, but it was Sunday afternoon games, never Sunday night games for Duquesne. Right. You go to church, you have basketball practice, and you go to the Duquesne game at two or two p.m. when it was going to start. Yeah, it was a great, great time. And I, I, I was very privileged growing up. And uh, we have a mutual friend in Sonny Vaccaro who introduced us many years ago. I think I'm trying to remember where it was. I think some AAU tournament or something like that. But anyway, so great to have Matt on. Round ball practice also, Dapper Dan round ball practice. I was a ball boy, Matt. So. <laughs> hey, somehow, I was. somehow everything goes back to the uh, Vaccaro family, right? A lot of it, yeah, yeah a lot of it. Great. That is great. Well, Matt Frigianic, thanks for joining us. Thanks for giving us your thoughts on the tournament, on uh, the seedings, and on uh, Pitt being left out. I know we got a couple of Pittsburgh natives here that are upset, and uh, that'll close the show. That'll do it for us here on Sports by the Book. Jeff Parles back in this very chair tomorrow. Uh, Danny Burke joining for a lot more bracket breakdown. First four starts today, ends tomorrow. Tournament itself starts on Friday for Jerry, Drew Dog, and Ann behind the glass. For Chris Andrews hopping on at the end, and my partner, Alex White, I'm Matt Neverett saying thanks for tuning in. Jeff Powell's back tomorrow. This has been Sports by the Book.